what we haven't decided, what we haven't yet got to is a point of understanding where that appropriate level is for our, our, our perception of where we should be going. But a lot of the ills that deer are responsible for or are perceived to be responsible for aren't necessarily their responsibility. They're not producing the habitats that are perceived to be degraded. A lot of the damage that those habitats demonstrate today was done by sheep in the preceding 150 years. Welcome. This is the Into the Wilderness podcast, and I am your host, Byron Pace. This podcast is coming to you two days late on the 5th of May 2021, so I am so very sorry. I had great intentions of finishing the edit for this on Sunday in preparation for the Monday release, and then a filming schedule got moved ahead. We had an opportunity to go and get a couple of hours on Sunday and get ahead of two days of production, and so I had to leave. And I didn't finish editing this, and I had absolutely zero time <laughs> while we were filming the last couple of days. Uh, and so here we are on Wednesday morning, I'm finishing this to bring you this amazing conversation with Dr. Kathy Main, who's an ecologist who lives in Scotland. We really dive into what land management is, what a sustainable future in the countryside, integrating wildlife and people in the landscape and what that looks like. The two primary topics that we talk about, rewilding and deer management, two things that I get asked about all of the time in emails and on messages on social media to cover on this podcast. So this is the show that you need to listen to if you want to dive into these topics. Keep an eye out on social over the next couple of weeks for some short film releases because the project that I was just filming with the Atlantic Salmon Trust, which is an extension of what has been consuming so much of my time in the last five or six weeks, uh, I was actually two days filming with Robson Green, a lot of you will know him from the TV, and Jim Murray, also uh, an actor, two guys who were just brilliant to work with. Um, they're ambassadors for the Atlantic Salmon Trust, and uh, they very kindly gave up a couple of days for us to go and uh, make a film about the plight of Atlantic salmon. So that is what I was doing with a filmmaker from down south in Cumbria, Jago Miller, who was a brilliant second creative mind on this project. And I'm really excited to bring that to everyone. So you will be seeing that very soon because we have to turn around this project in the next couple of weeks. So check out my social media at Byron J. Pace. And you can also find the Atlantic Salmon Trust because they'll be they'll be sharing it as well. Quickly, before we get into the show, I have to give a shout out to all of the Patreon supporters and particularly those who are top-tier supporters, who this week include Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of RDContracting.co.uk, James Marchington, the guys at South Asher Stalking, Josh Starling, Thomas Cameron, Mark Zabrowski, the team at Galax Clothing, and Colin Knight. So thank you very much for your support, and everyone else who supports on the other tiers. It makes a huge difference to being able to put these shows out. And I do apologize once again for bringing you this show out late. Now, four weeks ago... We ran a competition in collaboration with Tecovis Boots to give you a pair of Tecovis Stocktons. And this is is the day. This is the day you're going to find out who won. So I randomly went through all of the social media posts that I was tagged in on Instagram and Facebook. I had a couple of emails as well who people who didn't use social. And I randomly selected... Lewis Stevens. So congratulations, Lewis Stevens. You are the winner of a pair of Tacobus boots. So reach out to me, info at paceproductionsuk.com. I will get your details and we'll get those boots out to you. And then maybe you can send a picture of us with your boots on in your natural environment. That would be pretty cool. The last thing to mention is the competition that we're running with this show, which is in collaboration with our partners, Modern Huntsman. As many of you will know, I'm the conservation editor as well for that publication, and we are right in the cauldron of production for Volume 7 right now. It is all kicking off. Uh, the next couple of weeks are going to be kind of crazy. There's some amazing stories to be told. If you want to buy Volumes 1 to 6, which are already out, then go over to modernhuntsman.com, and you can do that, or you can subscribe to future volumes as well. Uh, but we're going to give you the chance to win a copy of Modern Huntsman, and it's going to be super easy. So for this show, for the next two weeks, so in two weeks' time, I will announce the winner. I will randomly pick somebody who has uh, given a review on one of the, the 
podcast apps that you listen to the show on. Go and give this show a review and I will pick the best one and I will read it out on the show in two weeks' time and you will be the winner of a volume of Modern Huntsman. That's all for me for now. Enjoy this in-depth conversation with Dr. Kathy Main. I am about to dive back into the next two weeks of solid editing. I will see you on the other side. Kathy, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. What part of the world are you speaking to me from today? Your home country, I think. So this is this is where I stay here in the west of Scotland. I live near Fort William. Um, funnily enough, it's not where I was born and brought up. I, I come originally from South London, um, but I've been here since 1988, so in the Highlands, that is. So uh, definitely where I call home. Uh, so so I, you, you're a naturalized Scot in a way. I'm an adopted Scot. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I came up here on holiday with my parents when I was nine. And I went home from that summer holiday saying that that was where I was going to live. And you made it happen. I did. <laughs> so uh, tell me a little bit about, I mean, I'm, I, can't, I can't wait to get into the conversation today because uh, I, I was aware of some, some work that you'd done before and you, your name had come up in conversations I had had, particularly around deer, which is going to be a big focus of our conversation today. And then I saw you in a documentary, a documentary you were interviewed uh, called The Cull, uh, which was... Uh, a f- Given that it was made by two guys in London who didn't really know anything about what was happening up here in this kind of rural landscape in Deer, I was amazed how well it, w- it was put together and, and the breadth of people that they, they spoke to. Um, so if you haven't seen it, for people who are listening, I'm not sure exactly where it's available now, but if you Google the cull, uh, you'll find it somewhere and, you, and you'll be able to watch it. But what is your background l- leading up to the conversation that we're about to have on, on deer and, and rewilding the landscape and how humans interact in it, particularly in Scotland. What was your background leading up to that? You're an ecologist, are you? I'm an ecologist now, but I definitely didn't start off that way. Uh, so I was, I was brought up in South London. Uh, my parents worked extremely hard to pay for a good education for myself and my brother. Um, we, we both went to good universities um, and we both got degrees in geography. Um, geography was my passion. And I was lucky enough to be taught by people who were at the forefront of climate change research at the time. This is in the mid 80s. And also human impact on the environment. So one of the formative people was Professor Andrew Gowdy, who um, wrote a series of books, one of which was titled um, the man's impact on the environment, I think. So it was very much about, you know, at that time, desertification in the sub-Saharan countries um, and the impact that climate was having, but as, uh, but also how humans were beginning to really quite significantly modify their environments. Um, I left university and came to Scotland to fulfil that dream and had no, had no job. <laughs> And then I started an environmental management MSc at Stirling, which then transformed itself into a PhD. And I wanted to look at climate change and its impact on um, vegetation on the highest bits of mountains in in deep snowbeds. Um, So I did uh, six and a half years, I think it took me far too long, to, you know, finish this mammoth piece of work. (laughs) And I was supporting myself doing bits of outdoor ed and working in climbing shops. I um, was so very interested in mountaineering. And I st- I'd started very early on when um, habitat impact assessment work was first really kind of being developed in the um, early to mid 90s. Um, I start- it's, it's pretty common now. Like, uh, most people will have heard of habitat impact assessments. Uh, but back then, we weren't really considering it, were we? No, and the, the seminal piece of work for Scotland uh, or for the Scottish Highlands was was written in 1998 by Angus MacDonald and, and co. But in the lead up to that, um, there were a number of different kind of experimental bits of work to look at, you know, things like plot size and 
also to target different habitats and, and, and what plot size was appropriate for different habitats and, and so on. So, and this was also at the time when um, our Natura suite was beginning to start to be developed or talked about. I mean, that actually kind of came into being in, in sort of 2000, 2001. But, um, sorry, sorry, what is that specifically so that people so the, understand? The, um, before, Natura, we had triple SI, Sites of Special Scientific Interest, um, which is the primary uh, designation for protection for nature conservation in the UK. And that's supported by the Wildlife and Countryside Act in 1981. Um, and then the birds and habitats directives from Europe were then translated into UK law. And the areas that were protected under those bits of legislation, uh, under those directives, uh, became our Natura suite. So that special areas of conservation, which are habitats based, special protection areas, which are birds based, and uh, Ramsar sites, which are, are significant wetlands. So that's a second tier of conservation, which sort of integrates with the triple SI suite. It, 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 they're more or less contiguous, but not completely. And it's not, um, it's a different perspective than the triple SI suite. So there's a little bit of tension in there, but certainly the requirement for the Natura designations as part of our commitments as being in the EU meant that we were doing some quite significant work looking at how habitats, particularly, which is where my interest is, um, are impacted uh, by humans, but also by other significant um, events, and that includes large herbivores, specifically deer. So I was beginning to get involved in that and, you know, looking to go into ecology full time. And very, very tragically, um, the girl I was going to be working for, I think, rather than with, um, died. And I was completely devastated by that. Um, and I, I completely about turned and, and went back to outdoor education for, oh, the best part of 10 years. Um, oh, quite a long period. Though. Yeah. So worked in outdoor ed, mountaineering, skiing, teaching, um, which was actually in some ways quite useful because it gives me a completely different perspective I understand the recreational side of things quite well. Um, it, yeah, not, I think I, I'm not a conservationist who doesn't who doesn't get the need and the value of having people in the landscape. Yeah, it's an interesting one that I, I've actually been having this discussion uh, quite a lot recently, which is this. Not that there is only two views of conservation; that there's multiple views of conservation. But at the at the extreme kind of polar end, if you look at to the, the sort of history of conservation, you had this uh, very much protectionist view, which stemmed from John Muir and, and the forefathers who came before him, and then um, Gifford Pinochet and and Aldo Leopold, which was much more about embracing people in the landscape and working out how conservation could be successful in a, in a landscape that we also participate in rather than keep people out of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think we haven't resolved that tension and that issue yet. And I think the need for a resolution is becoming more and more pressing uh, because I do feel that people, uh, particularly British people, um, are more and more divorced or cut off from nature. I mean, it's one of the uh, it's sad but true. One of the benefits of the pandemic has been that people have perhaps started to better understand their inherent need for green spaces and the ability to be outside and how restorative that is uh, as their lives have been more restricted. Um, but it... it understanding how recreation works and, and how it impacts on the environment is actually quite a valuable perspective. Yeah, definitely. So I came back into conservation and ecology in the early 2000s and have worked in ecology ever since. 
So what, what was the early work that, that you were doing as an ecologist once you came out of recreation? I think it's quite interesting, just to reinforce your point there, mm. there is a risk, and, and I've seen this with very, very well-intentioned, some of whom are friends, uh, who go through the academic system, only the academic system, and become an ecologist or a, a biologist in the field. And there is very much this uh, divorce of people as only a movement for bad in a landscape. And, and I, I think it's interesting that you're sort of period out living and working in an industry where, where people are, are using the landscape, not all, obviously not always in a way that is sustainable or, or, or sympathetic to the environment around you, but understanding that, that people have a place. I don't think that necessarily always comes through unless it's been, unless well, most of the time when, I, when I've seen people embrace that is because of some other experiences that they've had or it has been specifically taught. So I suppose my position would be that without the support and involvement of the general public, the wider public, conservation is dead in the water. It requires public support to be successful. And we will never be successful in a wider sense of halting and hopefully reversing the decline in the global environment unless everybody understands how important it is for them as well as everybody else. So I genuinely believe that without everybody being on board, there is no good future for us. And you see it uh, as the only way for that to happen is for people to be integrated in the landscape, not removed from it. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's about reconnecting people with a very fundamental part of their biology, which is to feel integrated into the environment in such a way that they um, feel enriched by it. And at that point, people start to understand what they need to do to enhance both the environment but also their, their own lives. And once that starts to happen, then it becomes progressively easier for people to start to behave in ways which are environmentally helpful as opposed to environmentally damaging. So, you know, for example... Um, once you've done some gardening and you've got your hands dirty and you understand a little bit more about how plants grow and what kills them and, and you know, how important they are to your spiritual well-being as well as your ability to put food on the table, then that starts to reconnect you with how important, um, you know, the wider environment is to the well-being of not just you but everything else. So, so how do we square the national park establishment in places like uh, like the, the U.S. or uh, some of the national parks in Africa and, and there's multiple national parks in Asia, which are really established as reserves, but reserves where people can visit, but they are in many cases not only not allowed to be in, but if you were to go back in a historical context, uh, context, were actively removed from those landscapes. Is that something that we need to redress with with what we understand now? I mean, it was done. I was going to say it was done with the best of intentions at the time, but I think there was probably some, uh, particularly if you're looking at North America, there was sort of a barrage of deep-seated racism, particularly with indigenous people there, which removed people from landscape. So that's an, el an element of it. But in terms of uh, nature and the preservation of wildlife and trying to correct a lot of the uh, degradation that had happened through through market hunting or over-harvesting and over-extraction, that was why it was set up then, was to try and restore and protect nature. Yeah, and... <sighs> 
this is a really big, this is a huge question because. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 this is why I wanted to ask you because I know that this is, not everybody thinks about this stuff all the time. A lot of people just kind of take it for given. Isn't this an amazing thing that we have these protected reserves around the world? They don't always work, not the way that people really think if you really start to dig into what they're achieving. And I think that's probably misunderstood as well. Yeah, um, I I think in the current set of circumstances, reserves are critical for a degree of protection of stuff that otherwise will disappear in a very short space of time. So they have a job to do, but... Uh, increasingly they will become isolated pockets of less damaged ecosystem in a wider ecosystem which is increasingly damaged and destroyed. And that is a product of the system. It's a product of our social norms. It's a product of our expectations in life. And that's not just um, those of us who are lucky enough to have been born into a much more um, well-to-do, higher standard of living part of the world, but you know the aspirations of everybody else on the planet to have the standard of living that I have. Um, and it, whilst we have a system which is dedicated to an increase in consumption and an expectation of greater consumption next year than this year in order that my standard of living can go up, i.e. a growth economy. Whilst we have a growth economy, the protected areas have a finite life and that time frame is only a little bit longer than everywhere else. So, you know, looking at um, the acceleration in the rate of deforestation in the Amazon, which from a carbon perspective is the worst possible thing we could be doing, is driven by consumption. So my desire to reconnect people with their environment partly stems from the fact that genu genuinely it makes you feel better. So you get that sense of well-being. But it's also partly because I believe that once you start to realize that these priceless things actually are more important than the size of your bank account, that then starts to change your perspective on what's important. And then we have the opportunity to adjust people's perspective to one which is about bringing nature into all parts of our lives, rewilding us. We are the ones that need to be rewilded. We don't need to rewild the rest of the planet, the rest of the environment. We are the ones that require that um, process. And whilst we're just focusing on, on protecting the environment for our from our own predations, which is exactly what that is, it's all the wrong way around. We actually need to turn that on its head. And we will only do that when we recognize the fact that a perpetual growth economy in a finite world is uh, a death sentence for us and for everything else. It's a, it's a really crucial point that, and... I, it's something I've been thinking about a lot uh, recently, mainly because of some, some different things that I've been uh, looking at and writing about and studying. And it, there are some examples of where that, or there are discussions of how to correct that. And that is to integrate the actual, the, the, the value of natural capital, of natural assets within our measure of what wealth is, which is a, a, a human construct in, in, in itself. And it, it is whatever we want to define it to be. And there are, there are multiple measures of, of, of what wealth and growth is. And there are some countries, I think, I, I can always struggle to remember which country this is. I think it's Bhutan, I think, uh, where they've actually 
in their version of GDP, they've integrated natural capital in that. Because exactly to your point, if you're, it's fine having a system which uh, focuses on growth year on year if it is encapsulating the trade-offs of that growth. So you might have you know, material wealth uh, and businesses and, and, and companies growing. But if your natural capital is declining at the same rate, then you're static. If your natural capital is going up and, and that is static, then you're actually, you're actually growing in, in terms of wealth. But what do we value and how do we value it really gets to the core of what a sustainable future should look like for humans. And, and we are so far from fully integrating that yet. Yes, I agree. Um, I, I'd like to think that um, the system that we currently have might be able to solve these problems. And 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 yes, you're right. You know, the idea of a, you know, national well-being that doesn't look at, um, can you know, standards or uh, normal standards of 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 wealth. But a wealth measure that encapsulates lots of other things. You know, how much green space can you access? How many, how much biodiversity is there in your in your local area? Um, blah blah blah. I I suppose I'm I'm just a little bit cynical because I I I actually think that in those places where um, people are most living most in tune with their environment. Um, they are generally people who are um, well connected with nature and they don't anticipate a higher standard of living. They are very content to go on living the way that their ancestors lived and they value those things which are not material. So, you know, I can't imagine that. Um, Indigenous peoples are really that bothered about, you know, how big their flat screen TV is. Mostly they tend to be much more focused on the precious parts of their natural heritage on which they have depended in the past. Um, and and, I, and they, they know that losing those things leaves them much poorer than, you know, the poverty of not having a bigger flat screen television. I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with you, and I, I think that a lot of the, a lot, a lot of the stresses and impacts that we are seeing around the world, particularly I mean, the, the, the parts of the world that we normally focus on when we're having these discussions, are those of highest biodiversity value because those are the ones that we've seen declining most rapidly. But if we look at the reasons why they are declining. It is because of externalities exported from the richest parts of the world because of our overconsumption, and you can see that in the the footprint network. If you if you to, to look at our um, bio capacity and, and the deficit that most countries have, and we have to extract from other parts of the world in order to to feed our our thirst for progress. Um, how how you tackle that? I I don't really know. I. I've thought about it a lot, and we've seen what has happened in you know over the last year when everything has pretty much ground to a halt, and everyone's asking the question: How do I how do I make a living when things slow down? So how how do we? Is it possible to maintain the standards of living? Obviously, standards of living around the world are a vast spectrum, from the most opulent to the very poorest people in the world. Um, can we maintain a standard of living for people who already have a good standard of living and raise the standard of living for people who are below the poverty line and do that in a sustainable manner where we are considering this sort of uh, problem with with perpetually the the need to to, to grow and and extract and consume yeah um tricky one that um <laughs> I suspect that. Um, I mean, is there too many people? I mean, I, this gets brought up a lot, and I, I don't know whether it's. Uh, I almost feel like it, it's kind of a lazy excuse for saying why we have problems. But it, does that get to it? 
with with the in current with the current system, yes, we definitely have too many people. Mm. Um, if if everybody on the planet, I mean, let's face it, I you know do not have a particularly wealthy lifestyle in comparison with the rest of the people in the UK. But you know, it's it's more than adequate. It's perfectly adequate. If everybody in the planet was entitled to aspire to have uh, access to the resources that fuel my lifestyle then we're screwed um there there is no there is no way that the planet can find enough resources and no way that our technology i think can become fancy enough to solve that problem so uh, whilst understanding and acknowledging the fact that education and improvement is one of the ways of modifying population growth um I don't see at the moment the trend is for a greater um, range of wealth um, from the poorest to the richest. That gap seems to be getting bigger and bigger. It would be a good thing if we could at least try to reduce that. Um, And that means trying to modify the super wealthy trying to modify how that group of people choose to spend their time and and use their wealth um but uh, again it's part of the system that we live under i i i support a family in nepal um i have done for over 20 years and there are many things about their lifestyle which actually I'm quite jealous of because they have a connection and quality in their life which I struggle to find. Um, and there's a consistency um, of their sense of place, their sense of belonging, their knowledge of who they are and where they come from. Um and I feel quite stateless and unrooted relative to that. But of course, they live in a uh, an environment where they actually aspire to my lifestyle. And wh- why would I want to deny that, that that there are many things that are more comfortable about the way that I live? I, c- I can't deny that. Um, I think that in reality it's going to require us all to make some changes and make some perceived sacrifices, which actually we probably will eventually work out aren't sacrifices at all. They're actually modifications of behavior which feel good in themselves. But I'm not, I'm not seeing the political appetite or the desire for for that, you know, in a wider context, this is becoming a little bit too deep and a little bit too scary for a lot of people um, who... It doesn't win votes. I uh, know. Saying that, we, <laughs> saying that we should slow down. <laughs> That's for sure. I wonder, something that just was springing to mind as you're, as you're taking that sort of very deep emotional dive there, was that when we think about uh, the conservation of nature and how we fund it, very often we're funding it with the same systems that have caused the problems in the first place, uh, which is this, this sort of great contradiction. And I, I agree with pretty much everything that you've said there. Uh, and that if we are to, like ecosystem services, for example, if we are getting companies to to compensate for, um, say, the restoration of wetlands because they benefit from uh, providing clean water to a population um, downstream and charging people for that. Or if it's a, a public company, then it's being paid for somehow. And so it's in their interest because of the higher costs of having degraded wetlands and all the extra filtration and treatment that they would have to uh, embark upon if the wetlands are, are degraded to invest in those wetlands to... Um, embrace the the natural system which gives us clean water but in order to do that uh, just the same as carbon markets 
something is being extracted to access somewhere else to fund that. This is this is the 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 absolutely that encapsulates the reason why I am really struggling with the rewilding agenda in Scotland at the moment. Um, so, so just I, I want I want to dive into that because I but explain what the rewilding agenda that you see is in Scotland um, before you you we really get into the issues conceptually that you you possibly have with it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Not everybody will know. It's quite an international audience on the podcast. <laughs> right. Um, so we have um, a couple of significant government policies which are extremely well-intentioned um, in an attempt to, I suppose, meet our, our desire to be carbon neutral, um, which include uh, an increase in woodland or forest cover and, and peatland restoration because peatlands are um, one of the most... Um, efficient carbon stores and the potential for carbon emission from damaged peatlands and, and you know across Scotland there's an awful lot of peat it, it, it's very very significant um, so these policies are set within the context of a, a wider movement and drive to try to restore some of the ecosystems in mostly the highlands, but, you know, that's not exclusively so. Um, and that is partly in terms of habitat restoration, but it's also through um, species reintroductions like the beaver, which we've already had, and the white-tailed eagle. And the proposals are for now for lynx and uh, people talk about wolves as well. Um, we also have, at the same time, a background of a relatively large deer population, red and roe, and Sika now as well. Um, and there are there are numerous tensions that also tie into the social struggles with um, how shooting has panned out in in the highlands and the class nature of hunting um so uh what we would call sport i suppose hunting as sport um and there's a lot of social unease around that which is now pa uh, playing out in a rewilding agenda um so uh, the the pure sort of environmental objectives are being um, somewhat diverted or, or blurred by um, some some social inequalities. So that that seems to be where we're at at the moment, and there is a re rewilding movement, and there are a number of uh, philanthropic. Um, individuals and there are a few groups of people who are working to um, restore environments to what they perceive to be a natural state on the face of it that that statement is one that you would think most people would kind of get behind do we want to restore uh degradation of environments that have been you know, negatively impacted by various different human endeavors over the last couple of hundred years. So where where is the, the issue there? Where does the conflict arise? Um, so there are a number of issues. Um, first of all, I would suggest that the sort of basic premise around ecosystem restoration in the face of quite significant and rapid environmental change, which is not just climate, but predominantly climate, is misguided. So why would we look to go back to a perceived state of naturalness, naturalness when the factors that determine that 
condition might actually want to produce a different picture. So my my feeling is that the best thing we can do is to restore environmental processes and make sure that they are free to operate without too much um, interference. And never mind what it looks like, because nature will do what nature is going to do. I think the idea of having a fixed a fixed view of what it should look like and what it should contain is uh, it's very anthropogenic and it's not helpful. So I would don't go down a processes route rather than a reconstruction route. Um, so that's that's the first one. And when you say just for clarification, that when you say processes, you're talking about hydrological cycles, the, the regeneration, the natural regeneration of, of woodland, things like this. Yes, I think um, I think we would be we would be looking to do a little bit of interference, but actually letting nature get on with the rest of it. I think there are places where we definitely do need to intervene. Um, but there are also systems where um, our interventions potentially are counter to what the system is trying to do um, uh, because our, our view, our vision of what we should have is um, not as well informed as we would like to think it is. It's historic. Our view is historic. We're hindcasting. We can't forecast. So, I mean, if we kind of turn our, take this uh, and turn our attention to what you were talking about in, in the documentary, The Coal, a lot of that focused around the population of deer that we have. Now, we've seen multiple reports in the last 18 months that have come out from the Scottish government. And they've actually, I think they, they agreed to almost all of the recommendations in the, the Working Deer Group report. We are going to see a push now to drastically reduce deer populations in Scotland. Is that something, in your view, that's necessary? Uh, how, how is that going to happen? What is the main drivers behind this? What are they trying to achieve by it? And what are the implications of doing this? Um, so uh, without doubt, um, the deer population, the red deer population, has expanded significantly since the Second World War. Um, and there are estimates vary but there are you know sort of around about the 400,000 mark I think it's true fair to say um and that distribution the distribution of that number is not um even and there are definitely places where the level of impacts that deer have on their environment is unhelpful for that environment to be in a healthy condition i.e that that their impacts are causing a decline in the health of the habitat deer all herbivores have an impact where the level of that impact transforms from one which is you know healthy and and tolerated and indeed around which the environment you know the habitat can adapt quite successfully and quite healthily, where that tips into um, what you would term damage, i.e. there is a, a downward spiral in the condition of the habitat caused by those impacts, that, that tipping point is quite difficult to identify. And it does depend entirely on where you are in the country, what the weather conditions, the climatic conditions are, what the bedrock's like, how deep the soils are, the angle, the aspect, the altitude. I mean, there's a, a whole host of different factors affecting that and it is true to say that there are still places where it would appear that the level of impacts would constitute damage if you want to define damage by that sort of habitat deterioration and has that been is that as a result of people not managing the deer populations effectively because uh, f just for again for uh, for people outside of the UK 
deer don't really have any predators. I mean, sea eagles might take a few calves and stuff, but in the grand scheme of things, they don't really have any major predators here. It's it's us. So we we are we are the we are the predator. Um, they don't have, as you say, major predators, um, but they do have, as all populations do have, ways of um, <laughs> self-regulating through mortality. Um, so that's that's the way in which these populations would self-regulate. And um, the Dutch experiment um, where you know herbivores have remained unchecked where they have now been culled has been very, that was pretty horrendous very traumatic for people to see but it's actually a very natural phenomenon the size yeah. size of the enclosure was probably way too small but you know boom and bust populations are common in nature and nature is fairly brutal and the nature of of herbivores is such that you know, their populations tend to all starve a little bit when resources are in short supply. And when they get in very short supplies, quite a lot of them die. Um, and in predator populations, you tend to have a sort of stable background population that is always well fed. And then on the margins, you may have more or less, um, depending on, on the availability of prey. So it, this is a natural part of, of um, our our environment, our, our nature, if you like, but the the question as to whether deer populations have been well managed or not, it's actually much more complex than that because a lot of the, um, because deer are free ranging, because they don't belong to anybody, nobody has a right to them other than the right that is conferred through land ownership, which is a right to take them. This is very ancient law in Scotland. Nobody actually owns them. And they can roam across ownerships. Managing them then becomes actually quite difficult because, you know, what happens to be on my ground during the culling season, during the season where it's it's considered legal to cull them, um, might be not a desire for me to carry out because actually my habitats are in fine condition but they're actually on your ground damaging your ground when you can't cull them um and so you and i need to liaise so that i cull deer to help you get what you want in terms of the environment and that's a really difficult thing to do multiple ownerships with multiple different objectives but another thing which is significantly impacting on deer populations over the last sort of 20, 30 years has been the loss of the winter range. So deer winter lower down and will head to the hills higher up in the summer. And much of the low ground for, for deer in the highlands has been lost to forestry. So woodland cover is going up. There's been significant deforestation. And a lot of that has been on ground where traditionally deer have wintered. And add into that also um, a complex agricultural system and the fact that the very large number of sheep, particularly, which were certainly here in the hills when I first came here 30 odd years ago, um, that's gone down dramatically. So there's a number of different factors affecting the availability of different habitats to support the deer population. And it's not just as simple as, oh, they've not been managed correctly. There are other social factors and economic factors which also impact on how they're managed. Um, and uh, traditionally, um, mostly it was only stags that were culled. Um, going back 100 years, you know, virtually nobody culled any hinds. Now we have a much more modern view as hind numbers have gone up. And we now understand much better that we need to cull females, particularly we need to cull females if we want more males. And the value is in the males. So this delicate balance between um, 
how you very carefully select within a herd which animals you take is a, is a far cry from what stalking was 100 years ago. And a good deer manager nowadays will know exactly what, how many deer he's got. He'll know where they are. He'll know when they leave his property and when they come back. He'll know where his stags come from if they, they're not produced on his ground. And he will know how to manage his deer numbers so that he has the optimum for the, for the health of the population. But, of course, that's the ideal, and not everybody is able to deliver that for a whole host of different reasons. So the, the, the conflict that was being discussed as a, a core point in that documentary was the difference in what landowners were wanting, particularly from the rewilding camp, which was in my mind, really focused on tree regeneration, if I was to pick one aspect, although, like you pointed out, the reintroduction of lynx, which is a discussion which has been ongoing for a long time and is kind of resurfacing again now, uh, and beavers, but trees is the thing that everyone always goes to. And then on the other hand, you have the, the more traditional management, particularly in the uplands, which was often focused on sporting purposes and, and deer stalking. Where people want to regenerate trees, they want to see, in, in some cases, almost no deer, if you were to look at the, the densities that they want, which conflicts. And there aren't fences around a lot of these places. Would that be fair to say? Is that Does that get to the sort of the crux of where some of these conflicts arise in the rewilding debate when it comes to deer populations here? Yeah, I think that's probably fair to say. I think that um, the appetite for woodlands without fences, woodland regeneration without fences, is, is the, you know, seriously undermined and threatened by a background deer population, which um, is going to struggle to let that happen. But it, it's, again, it's never that simple. Um, and I think that one of the problems one of the problems with the rewilding agenda is that it it is a little simplistic in its in its outlook um and the focus on trees is is fine but i mean one of your previous contributors on your scientific shorts nina friggins shows quite clearly that we need to be very very careful in the highlands where we have a huge amount of peaty soils not even deep peat but peaty soils where actually putting trees is not necessarily a carbon neutral or carbon beneficial thing to do so if you're going to ca catch it in in carbon terms it's not necessarily wise to cover quite a lot of the highlands in trees and it's not even necessarily very natural either so it's, it's funny that you say that because I, I think if you were to probably, I mean, I'm guessing here, but if you were to poll the average person walking on the street, the narrative that they've been fed is that Scotland was covered from the West Coast shoreline to the East Coast shoreline and the very north of Scotland in trees. And it's not true. Why have we been fed this? Because am I wrong? Or is that just the perception I have? Have we been fed this? Yeah, I, I, it's the perception that I had as well um, for a long time. Well, the first question mark that when it appeared in my brain was when I did an undergraduate dissertation looking at pollen analysis in the post-glacial period up in the, in the limestone area around... Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, that Rattle. would tell you. Then and you would know. <laughs> there was no statistically significant change in arboreal pollen content in the core in the last 8,000 years. Okay. So actually it was never significantly more wooded, or at least that's what that initial very simplistic, um, because it was an undergraduate dissertation, piece of work indicated um, and, oh, man, I could have stayed there and done a PhD if I'd been really particularly keen on the idea of staying in the southeast of England, but I wasn't, so that wasn't going to happen. But I do think that we – I don't know exactly where that where it comes from, but there is this view. And, well, maybe maybe one of the reasons why this view persists is because, actually, when you walk around the highlands in the peat, you see lots and lots of tree stumps. You see lots and lots yeah, of woodland. Do. And there was mm. woodland much more extensively. 
um, up until the Atlantic period, which is four to five thousand years before the present time, when we were in the climatic optimum of this particular interglacial. And, you know, I was looking at stumps last week, which were clearly Scots pine. You could, I mean, the bark was still there. It's eroding out of the peat now, so it'll disappear. The preservation of peat is incredible. I know, it's amazing. And there's the Scots pine with the, you know, little flaky bits of reddish bark still there. But that tree is, you know, four or 5,000 years ago was, was living and has since been inundated by peat. And this is interesting because this is in a landscape where actually the bedrock is limestone and the limestone has been inundated by peat. So it's, a, you know, the development of peat across the highlands has been one of the things that's been massively changed from a more wooded to a much less wooded landscape. It's got very little, I think, to do with human intervention and an awful lot more to do with climate. So, so maybe that's where, that's where this quasi-myth comes from. But it is also true to say, and I'm not going to deny it, that we would benefit significantly by having more woodland cover what I yeah, struggle in the with, right places. Exactly. What I struggle with is a policy that says we have to have trees everywhere and we need to meet a particular target, a number, in order to deliver, you know, a policy. So I I really I really struggle with something that is too simplistic and also that in order to deliver this, we are actually going to eliminate um, a social group of people who have been living and working on the land for generations in order to achieve this goal. And so there's the social injustice, which actually for me is probably at least as important as the environmental lack of um, <sighs> breadth and depth. Yeah. It feels very arbitrary. The, the the tree planting targets feel very arbitrary to me, and I think it it's kind of it's played into the hands of people where who are have long embraced the rewilding debate. And I think in many instances, they probably also understand that these just numbers of trees in places across Scotland doesn't make much sense, that it needs to be way more strategic than that, and not just in terms of where they are, but what we're actually what we're actually planting. But because it kind of reinforces the the core of the agenda that they have, I haven't heard much noise from that camp. And I, I wonder as I'm saying that whether whether that it's fair to really bundle people in that rewilding camp, because has it evolved? I know if you were to go back 15, 20 years ago when rewilding as a, a concept was really coming to the fore in, in the UK and particularly up here in Scotland. And it, it had a, a lot of negative connotations to it as well, and, and particularly with maybe unfairly the kind of people who wanted to do it. Has has it evolved now? Is it? Do we need uh, a different word for it to be more embracing of of the spectrum of views that that might entail? Yeah, you're probably right about that. Um, not <laughs> not for me to suggest. Um, I, I I do think that there's more common ground than we sometimes think. So yeah, I would quite like to find ways to um participate in a, in a in a better debate rather than shouting match about um where the future lies but i am deeply concerned about the likelihood that we will destroy a um group of people there that currently occupy the rural economy um environment in in our more remote communities who have children in schools and who support um, the existence of some of the more remote communities. And we will destroy that 
believing that deer are the problem, we will destroy everything about their way of life. And they have far more right to be there than we do because they've been there on the land for generations. And we haven't got anything sensible to replace it with in order to keep them there. So that loss will be felt in rural communities. And we also risk at the end of the day getting to a point where we suddenly realize that actually we've got rid of all the deer and that wasn't the problem. <laughs> and we've, yeah. bro- we've broken the system, we've destroyed the system and now we need it back, but it's too late. It's very difficult to bring things back, uh, uh, which which plays I- exactly into the, you know, we, we know this. And, and I think that's one thing we would all agree with across the spectrum of what kind of conservation you believe in is that bringing things back once you've lost them is, is, is very difficult. It takes a lot of time, mm-hmm. it takes a lot of energy. And sometimes at that point, the landscape has changed so much that it might not really be possible. And I think that's one of the things with the, the rewilding conversation. I'm not sure whether the landscape has shifted so much for some species that they want to bring back that it's just not viable to do anymore. And I, you know, I in some ways I'm a rewilder at heart. I love immersing myself in wild places where I feel like I'm reconnecting myself with the way I would, in many respects, rather be living, where there are, you know, when I, where I'm aware of, of less people. And that's why I spend so much time in very remote places in North America, why I spend so much time in remote places in Central Africa is because I, because I love that. But equally, I'm aware that, and this, this kind of goes back to the beginning of our conversation, that if we want to protect a lot of these areas in the current system that we're living in, which puts a huge amount of pressure on the natural environment. We need people in those landscapes who care about it because they rely on it to survive. And if you remove those people, who's really going to care? Because people sitting a thousand miles away, making like your armchair conservationist, making very kind of preservationist uh, or taking very pre- preservationist uh, opinions on conservation, I don't think has a long-term future. Agreed. I agree with all of that because um, the, the, what's happened in Africa in a, in a much bigger way is, is you know, in a, in a smaller way is demonstrated in Scotland. Um, if we involve local people and... Um, give value to the resource then we have their support and their commitment if we um, take them out of the equation then um, there is very little future for conservation because uh, they will find other ways to make a living that is detrimental because we force them to what I see happening here in the future is um, a loss of, <laughs> well, at the moment, we've got woodland expanding, which is great. And most of it's behind fences. And that's, you know, that's fine. So we don't have a huge issue. But 20, 30 years down the line, when we have significantly more woodland cover, and those fences are no longer tight or have been removed, we will have an explosion in the population of woodland deer, which will be... <laughs> which are going to be very difficult to manage. <laughs> which is going to be roe and seeker and yeah. to a certain extent red. And an explosion, a further explosion in feral pigs, which is the next big problem, which yeah. we haven't managed efficiently and is now out of hand. And the model that we will have going forwards for the management of those deer has nothing to do with deer welfare it will be a contractor based system where you see it you shoot it and that is the opposite end of the spectrum in in welfare terms from where we are with the old system the man spending a lot of time spying his deer with his binoculars working out which animals need to be culled 
who knows them sufficiently well because he can see them that he will he will know how to manage it up or manage it down which groups to take you know how to do it all of the, the detail in that we will have lost all of that and we will end up with a contractor based system where you just you just shoot them you just shoot them and cart them off to the game dealer and nobody because cares because they're they're a problem they're a problem in or they're viewed as a problem in the landscape why, why have it's, we it's, why have we why have we demonized red deer or deer why have we demonized deer and yet everything else is protected I don't understand this. Everything, everything in excessive numbers is a problem, but everything is a part of the natural landscape and needs to be supported, needs to be nurtured in an appropriate way. What we haven't decided, what we haven't yet got to is a point of understanding where that appropriate level is for our our, our perception of where we should be going. But a lot of the ills that deer are responsible for or are perceived to be responsible for aren't necessarily their responsibility. They're not producing the habitats that are perceived to be degraded. A lot of the damage that those habitats demonstrate today was done by sheep in the preceding 150 years. Some of which was funded by government. <laughs> Most of which was funded by government. Yeah. Yeah. The, see, the other contradiction that I that I see here, which I, I struggle to understand, uh, although I, I am, I mean, I really put it down to politics more than anything else and public perception, is that the future that we're looking at right now, with with the deer reports that have come out and the 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 Scottish government embracing most of those recommendations, uh, which I did a separate podcast uh, a little while ago um, before they had been accepted, talking about what some of those recommendations will be, is that in one hand, there is this uh, dislike from, uh, I would say, a majority of, of the, the public, most of whom live in urban centres, but particularly from uh, the Scottish government, for people who partake in these kind of activities centered around what is in in Scotland a lot of private estates managing deer populations and i think a lot of that has to do with um, historic ties to to land ownership and a perception of the type of people who are doing these hunting activities but in the same breath we're saying actually we want someone whoever it might be to go in half the population of deer out there undertaking the same activity that is they find kind of disgusting and don't want to see it on the landscape anymore, but in, to your point, a, a manner that really has nothing to do with the welfare of the species that they're talking about. Yes, and this is an, an hypocrisy which is um, extraordinary, really, and we, we, again, not really addressed, not really talked about. But most of the NGOs um, who all wish to see fewer deer actually when they talk about it their membership becomes incredibly uncomfortable about the idea that anything's shot at all i've had pe- i've had people say to me you know can you not can you not dart them and relocate them somewhere else why do we have to shoot them and i i, I, I am gobsmacked that people can be so divorced from nature is to think that that is anything other than a completely anthropogenic construct. What about contraception is the other one that comes up? What's your view on that? I mean, I, I think it's completely impractical, but I, yeah, I'm interested I, I, from uh, someone who's an actual scientist. I don't know enough about it, but yeah, I, I would think delivery is going to be the stumbling block. So one of the, one of the issues that I, I do have with the Dear Working Group report is that apart from Richard Cook as an advisor, the people actually on the panel are not practitioners or are not people who are effectively deer managers or full-time. So the practicalities of delivering what they're talking about is not sufficiently well understood. And I also think that, uh, you know, 
the, for example, the 10 deer per square kilometer um, target is just oversimplistic and uninformed. So it, it's crazy to me that I mean I don't know if the people who are on the panel have actually walked around Scotland and realized that habitat changes quite a lot throughout the country but to have a blanket target is insane. Well if they it depends on the scale doesn't it? I mean if you look at it on yeah. a national on a national scale and Richard Cook's quite clear about this actually at the moment we are below 10. Yep, yep. So where's the problem? But if you if you want to apply it on a on a local or regional scale then there are problems. I have seen many places where four deer per square kilometre is too many for the incredibly damaged habitat that has been probably aggressively burned and overgrazed for centuries for agriculture, not by deer, for agriculture. And the deer are actually struggling to survive on it and absolutely their numbers need to be kept really low in order to, for it to decover. They're not the cause of the problem but they're preventing the recovery and there are places where i have seen in excess of 20 per square kilometer and the habitat is doing extremely well thank you very much indeed and there are not too many deer so what scale and that's on a on a, on a deer management group scale or what scale do we want to apply that figure because actually it's meaningless and pointless without an understanding of the underground underlying geology and the type and condition of the habitat over that geology. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what the solution is to, to this other than you raise an incredibly important point, which I think is repeated in so many of these higher level management decisions, which is that the people on the ground who live and breathe it are not integrated into these discussions. And we can talk about that here in rural Scotland with regard to deer, or we can talk about that uh, on the continent of Africa and making broad sweeping decisions from the Western world on how conservation should be implemented there without actually having discussion with the people who live with wildlife. And in my mind, Yes, you might end up with short-term gains, but if you're in this for the thousand-year project or the 2,000-year project, this only works if you don't disenfranchise the people who live there. And I I'm amazed that with the history that we have access to and how we have already screwed up the landscape, and, and some of that is by removing people, that we don't understand this yet. And this divisive approach in conservation feels in so many cases unnecessary because really if you boil it down to its most basic functionality, we kind of all want the same thing. We want a landscape that we can live sustainably in for many, many generations in the future and enjoy the, the wildlife that it exists now and tomorrow is in a better state than it was yesterday. Yeah. That's kind of what we all want. Yeah, and we want to be able to we want to be able to be confident that we're living sustainable lives in in a, a sense that it's you know globally sustainable rather than just, you know, well this patch is fine, so why do we worry yeah. about what's happening elsewhere on the planet? Uh, so much so much of this is makes no sense if you look at it globally this is what's happening here is just a, a privilege of wealth it's it's got nothing to do with global sustainability global sustainability would drive us to produce our own food would 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 be to do as much as we possibly can locally to make the land productive Whilst, Maybe eat more venison. Yeah, absolutely. Whilst integrating, yeah. whilst integrating rewilding into those processes and allowing people to enjoy that. But we're we're determined, we're determined to to send all of that, all of that product production somewhere else for somebody else to deal with. Whilst we It's incredibly enjoy, irresponsible, actually. Well it's it's dare I say it's crass. It, it's arrogant and it's crass 
and it's it's just completely wrong. Kathy, this has been one of the most uh, in-depth conversations I've had on the topic uh, with anybody and certainly on the podcast. Uh, I think that there will be people really evaluating in their minds what, the, particularly if they live in the UK where the, this conversation has been focused, what they see as the future of how we want to use our landscapes. Uh, and that's kind of the point of this podcast is not necessarily to provide solutions to answers, but make people part of the debate so that they they want to be part of it. And I, I think that you've definitely done that with the, the conversation that I've had with you today. So I, I really thank you for your, your time and your insight. Oh, thank you very much indeed for giving a, a platform in which to air my views. And if I don't expect people to agree with me, but if if it provokes people to start to ask a few more questions of themselves, then that would be a good thing. Kathy, are you um, are you on any social media, or can people read the, some of the work that you're doing? Where can people find you? Um, increasingly, I'm not on social media. Um, I I do have. I suppose probably my Instagram accounts, um, which is Kathy Main Six Five, um, is probably the one where I'm most likely to post stuff. But increasingly, I, I I choose not to use social media, partly because I just can't be bothered with the, I just can't be bothered with reading what people want to yeah. say. <laughs> it's also very time consuming. I get it. But you have a website as well. I do. Um, yes, so that's mountainenvironmentservices.com. Well, Kathy, thank you once again. And I hope at some point we, we have the chance to meet in person since we don't live that far apart. Thank you. I would look forward to that very much indeed. <laughs>